Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Ecology Live. I'm Pete Manning, and I'm the chair of the Events, Events Committee for the British Ecological Society. Today's a, a, a different Ecology Live session in that it's the first that we had to come at the new time of 9 a.m. UK time. Um, uh, and so many of you might be joining for the first time. Uh, I'll say a little bit about the series and, and how it runs uh, in a moment. Um, and if you want to see who's uh, uh, speaking in the series, then check our web, uh, the BES website. And uh, also, um, if you want to sign up for a newsletter to find out about everything else that the BES does. So I'm going to introduce uh, Hannah Mumby in just a moment. But first, I would like to thank our sponsors, Wildlife Acoustics. They produced that wonderful uh, sound that you just heard. I think it was some whales or cetaceans. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, on the uh, on the intro there, and we also thank uh, Oxford University Press, who are sponsoring this whole series of twelve talks. And you can find details of their Ecology Live reading list, which includes some discounts and some free content on the slide at the end of the talk. So this talk is being recorded for, uh, you on, for YouTube and you can watch it there afterwards. And if you want to ask a question, then you can do it in the question and answers box, um, which you should find at the, the bottom of your screen. There's no need to wait till the end, just ask the question and uh, we'll choose some questions at the end. Uh, you can do these either named or anonymous, you can decide. And you can upvote any questions that uh, you find particularly interesting by clicking the thumbs up icon and um, we'll prioritize the questions that have uh, a lot of interest. So now I will introduce our speaker, who is Hannah Mumby, and she's coming uh, from Hong Kong today. And it's in Hong Kong that the research that she's presenting today is based. It's on uh, wild boar uh, within the city of Hong Kong. And with that, I will hand over to uh, Hannah, um, who's with us yet. Hi, Hannah. Um, and I will uh, let you take it away from this point on. So um, thanks a lot for joining us today. And I'm looking forward to seeing you talk. Hi, everyone. I'm just going to share my screen with you right now. And I want to, while I'm doing that, thank Pete so much for the introduction and to the BES for inviting me. I'm going to contain my excitement and not say anything more just because I have so many things I want to talk to you all about and I want to get started. So Pete's already kind of introduced my topic. This, as you can see, is the beautiful um, Hong Kong skyline um, of an evening. And um, wild boar might not make very much sense in this context, but we're going to get there, okay? So stay with me. The way that we're going to get there is taking a few steps back from the skyline, right, initially, because I want us to do some thinking about the concepts and how we bring humans into ecological studies first, and then we'll get back to those four in the second part of the talk. So really, what I wanted to think about with you today, and it, I don't kind of want to place myself as an expert on this, but as someone who's learning, and it's a very experiential learning process for me, is how we frame our studies. Now, I go to a lot of excellent talks, including the BES live talks, and um, we often present our findings to each other as academics or even in kind of wider context to bigger audiences, right? And something that I find interesting, especially in terms of ecological studies, are that there's often kind of maybe at the end of a talk, this idea that, you know, this is the evidence that we've accumulated and that could be kind of um, translated into policy or might be relevant for other disciplines, but there are challenges involved in that, right? So the kind of failure of our findings to be integrated into policy or practice, we can perceive it ourselves potentially as a failure of communication, like maybe I didn't communicate effectively in a forum like this. Or we can say maybe it's differences in kind of concepts of knowledge and what knowledge or evidence are that don't necessarily cross disciplinary boundaries well, or boundaries between academics and practitioners, for example. Or we can say maybe it's because of differences in priorities or agenda. But actually, we don't know, <laughs> right? So it's only through further study that potentially we can begin to understand where our knowledge or evidence might fall through the gaps um, between the process of kind of our study and application, right? If we're interested in application and not all of us have to be, but many of us are. Um, so that's where I'm really coming at this talk from kind of 
my position. Um, and for me, I think that this links to the concept of interdisciplinarity, right? The um, integrating disciplines together um, to kind of create ways of seeing, ways of knowing, uh, and ways of interpreting and applying our studies. And I'm kind of positioning this in contrast to multidisciplinarity, where you might have these parallel um, disciplines being used together, this kind of concept of genuine interdisciplinarity. I mean, we could argue about what that was for the whole time, but we're not going to do that today because I need to move on, but happy to take questions or thoughts on that. But I did want to kind of reflect on myself and my own position within that um, in terms of like doing a study that has human dimensions, but also an ecological element. So how do I get to that myself? Well, I would say my own training is part of it. So I guess bold admission of the talk number one is that my original training is in anthropology. And then I actually studied epidemiology and statistics before I did my PhD in ecology. So I have this kind of interdisciplinary background myself, but obviously there's a temporal trend there as well in the ecology is what I studied most recently. So another way that I inter bring interdisciplinarity into my studies is through my group. So some of the people in my group might be pre present today. So hello to you. Um, but it includes people with backgrounds in geography and psychology, counseling, history, that become members of my group and they bring these different theoretical frameworks, analytical lenses to our studies. And beyond my group, obviously through collaborations, both within my university and beyond, I'm gonna, highlight um, a couple of collaborators that I have in Hong Kong at CityU, whose backgrounds are in animal behavior and veterinary medicine later on in the talk. Reading, of course, we all wish that we could read more. Actually, I wanted to highlight um, the importance that kind of teachings given me in reading and also reviewing, like however much we kind of push aside our time for reading and could read more. I think the reviewing is an important part of this. Um, asking questions, as I'm sure that some of you are going to after this. I've been examining a lot of PhDs recently and asking questions of the PhD students. Sometimes I can't even answer them myself, but to get their perspectives. And new journals, I mean new journals as in new to me because I might have kind of stuck to the center of my discipline before, but also um, newly introduced um, journals. And because this is a BES talk, I have to highlight People in Nature as a journal that I've been reading a lot recently. And I do think it's interesting to note again, um, I've only started studying wild boars in the last couple of years. And for the decade before that, I mainly studied elephants. And the interesting thing for me is that humans, their behavior, um, what's going on with them in terms of the system have always been present in my study. So like I've been studying an elephant, but you can see here there's a mahout on the back and the elephant's carrying this load of food. It's a captive elephant. So humans are very much kind of there explicitly or implicitly in my studies for a long time. Okay, so how do humans kind of enter into ecological studies? I think maybe some of you will disagree, but I think that we often conceptualize humans in our studies in the form of stakeholders. This talk that I'm giving you today, I am gonna be quite concerned with language, both in terms of specific words that we're using, but also in terms of language as in the English language, right? Um, so when we're thinking about stakeholders and the language of stakeholders, for me, it's really important to reflect on the fact that the concept of stakeholders, although it's been very much applied and taken on its own form in ecology, that it actually originated in corporate management. So these are some definitions. Um, the idea that they're the groups without whose support the organization wouldn't exist. The stakeholder approaches about groups and individuals who can affect the organization, about managerial behavior taken in response to those groups and individuals, right? Um, it's different in environmental studies. And this paper by De Lopez um, specifically mentions the concept of participation being integral in environmental studies when the stakeholder approach is used. So the main difference between the concept of stakeholders in conservation projects and the stakeholder theory of the firm is the emphasis on participation of all the stakeholders in conservation. You could argue it could be extended to ecology in general, um, rather than on the management of those stakeholders by an organization. 
So definitely this is a process of environmental studies taking on this kind of analytical framework, but then adapting it where it's suitable. But I still think for me, it's worth considering what does it mean and what does it do um, when we apply a theory from corporate management to the environment? It definitely shapes the lexicon, like whether we're aware of it or not, right? So concepts such as investment, management, benefits, they naturally become part of the framework, but we really have to critically interrogate, like, what does this mean for me? Does that affect how I'm viewing my system, how I'm placing myself within it and so on. And also I think it's really important. It places a focus on what or whom can be seen, heard, spoken to, right? And that I think puts a really big um, responsibility on the researcher to kind of identify these groups, but also like make sure that they're given a voice because what you don't want to do with these kinds of approaches, then you may want to kind of decrease marginalization um, of certain groups, such as minority groups, but you might inadvertently increase it if um, you're not kind of aware of who should speak or some groups that are involved, right? So it's a tricky topic. But I do think that it has this acknowledgement of plurality within it. So I've got this um, text here. Um, by taking an approach involving stakeholders implicitly or explicitly, the researcher is recognizing the existence of multiple groups with different values, objectives, knowledge, and experience. So this is where we're starting to link towards these concepts of values, behaviors, attitudes, right? So what are values? Good question. Um, so I've got some definitions for you here. Um, the links to the text are also available so you can read the whole papers yourself, but these are just little quotes. Fundamental cognitions, which serve as foundation for attitudes. There we go, the attitude word and beliefs. From this perspective, values are defined as enduring beliefs or mental constructs that are used to evaluate the desirability of specific modes of conduct or the ends achieved through such conduct. And then I put in the second definition because this says that values re refers to the perceived worth or significance of things, typically expressed in relation to the worth of other things. People's values cannot be measured directly. So this is hinting to us at methodology, right? Cannot be measured directly, only inferred through statements of beliefs or expressions of opinion. This really starts to hint to us, like if we wanna measure this or study this kind of thing, what, what kind of approach do we have to use? What kind of methodology is underlining this? And then directly on attitudes, environmental attitudes refers to the collection of beliefs, effect and behavioral intentions. So here we go down the line to behavior as well. A person holds regarding environmentally related activities or issues. So in terms of how they fit together, I think that there's a link between attitudes and values. However, and I wanna emphasize here, the link between values and environmental behavior is less clear. So people can have certain values, but how they behave can be affected by a lot of other kind of normative things to do with their personality, things to do with their environment and so on, right? So just to give you a little behavior definition, um, and again, you can go to the whole book and thank you to Yifu Wang who helped me with this. Um, behavior is actions or reactions of whole organisms or groups of organisms. And obviously the concept of behavior is core to psychology, but it's also central to the natural environment. We study behavior a lot in ecological studies too. So with that kind of framing out of the way, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about human wildlife interactions as kind of a case um, uh, of how we integrate the human um, attitudes and behaviors. And you can see actually within human wildlife interactions, there's a whole spectrum of the kinds of interactions. So you might have very physical ones, you know, this woman here who's losing her sandwich, or you might have, you know, ones that people seek out intentionally. This one's more physically distanced, but it's definitely a central part of this experience that's happening here is the interaction between these people photographing the birds, right? And within that context of human wildlife interactions, I wanted to get really more specifically into um, with this idea of wild boars. So this is a video that was taken by members of my group in Hong Kong of wild boars. And I mean, it all looks very nice, but um, some of this impact that the, that the boars have had on the environment through their behavior, you can't really ignore it when you're looking at this video too. 
So again, stepping back from Hong Kong slightly and thinking about boars more in general, um, one of the really interesting things about them is how widespread they are. So you can see them basically all the way across Eurasia here in the native range. And then they also have introduced ranges in Australia, Australasia, North America. So I'm kind of giving you the example in Hong Kong and we're gonna talk about that specifically today. But I think the really cool part of this is there are so many different cases that are involving different human populations, different boar populations, and some, um, potentially a nice um, basis for comparative work as well, right? Okay, so just one example from not Hong Kong, but across the range that this happened last year in the Tuffelsee um, in Berlin, that this person was doing some nice swimming as one often does um, unclothed. Um, in that location. And this boar um, removed their bag that contained their laptop and I think some food as well. So the person went off in hot pursuit of the boar, um, still unclothed, and was able to retrieve their bag. But this um, received substantial media attention, um, which was quite interesting. But what about in Hong Kong? You know, where did these interactions take place? And I think that I've possibly participated in you know creating the image of Hong Kong as this concrete jungle but for those of you who don't know the territory so well um there's a lot of green space there's a lot of protected area as well as some of the built-up areas particularly Kowloon in the northern part of Hong Kong Island but we also have some um, built-up areas in the new territories as well we have some wetlands too and um as I was saying actually to um, the BES members when I just entered the talk, um, within Hong Kong, wild boar are the largest native terrestrial wild animals around. Um, there used to be big predators in Hong Kong, tigers and so on. They've been extirpated, the human activities, hunting of them and so on and so on. It means that they're just not around anymore, um, but there are these wild boars still. So how does that kind of play out in Hong Kong? Well, you can have incidents like this, this um, pig that was termed pigzilla um, a few years ago, kind of standing up on the back legs, foraging in these like large rubbish bins. I've got the link if you want to watch a video about it um, more. Um, I've got a little warning for blood in case anyone doesn't like blood or you're eating your breakfast, look away now. Okay, this is another kind of incidence of a uh, human wildlife interaction in Hong Kong. This um, boar went into the subway, ended up having a physical interaction with a person, injuries involved, the boar ended up being euthanized, right? So it, it sounds like superficially like, oh, this is quite nice, boars in the city, but um, this can be the outcome in some circumstances. This is a more neutral one, and thank you to Alan McElligot for um, telling me about this. This is a boar just walking past a coffee shop here roughly the equivalent of a boar kind of wandering around in Fulham, um, kind of past co coffee areas. This is down in Kennedy Town, I think. And then in the financial district, this is a mother and four offspring. They're um, swimming in a water feature outside of the Bank of China building in right in the center of the financial district. So quite a way away from um, any kind of um, rural area with a lot of tree cover. And um, yeah, this would be roughly the equivalent of kind of boars swimming around Canary Wharf kind of area um, in London. So these interactions are happening. Um, this is one just from yesterday. So I added a little um, extra one to, to keep up with the news that's happening now. So this is again down in Kennedy Town, the one that I said, roughly equivalent to Fulham, um, where a piglet's been separated from the mother and the um, government um, wildlife department was called and the piglet had to be removed, but obviously backed against a wall in a quite kind of fearful state. So this is the reality of these kinds of interactions that are ha have happened over time in Hong Kong. So there's a real concern surrounding these interactions in, of health and safety of the people and animals involved. And there's the very real risk of African swine fever, which is a disease that can be contracted by the boar and domestic pigs, not by humans, um, but it can cause huge losses, economic losses and loss of the livestock um, if it gets into those domestic populations, which it has 
um, across Asia and Europe several times. So there's some really big um, concerns involved in this. So in terms of reports of interactions through the lens of complaints to the government wildlife department, which is AFCD in Hong Kong, they seem to have increased over time. But of course, we don't know if this reflects an actual increase in the um, incidents or just a kind of um, increase in people's willingness to report them or propensity to report them repeatedly or so on. But the, there is this trend um, that's involved and this is part of the reason that we got into doing these studies. So when people ask me a lot, are there too many boar? My kind of response to that is, well, it depends what we mean by too many. Like, is that something that can be measured in our tolerance to the animals in the city? Or is it something that we can quantify in terms of environmental impacts or carrying capacity of the land? And really that's kind of down to us to consider what, what we consider to be too many. Um, but I will tell you a little bit about the current policy in Hong Kong, um, just because it might be quite different to what some people are familiar with, is that when there are um, a large volume of complaints about a specific animal, or about a specific area, then they are translocated. Um, so they move from that area into some of those protected areas, country parks that I talked to you about. There's sterilization and contraception programs underway. So boar that are adults and that aren't pregnant are both males and females are sterilized and there's also contraception methods being used. These again are kind of targeted at areas um, where there have been a lot of complaints or reports of boar activity. And hunting of the boar is absolutely banned, does not happen at all anywhere in the, in the territory, possibly illegally, but again, it's not very common. So it might be quite different to what some people are familiar with. So what was our approach and direction to studying this? We actually took quite a different route um, to what I might normally have done in some of my studies of elephants and so on that we decided to kind of come at it from this more human angle, partly because of COVID, but um, partly just because of our general interests and the members of my group's interests as well. So we came up with this kind of idea of the Hong Kong wild boar project to look at how the human wild boar interactions are portrayed in the media, exploring a little bit on the human attitudes and perceptions involved, and then also having the more kind of traditional ecological side on ecological impact, physiology, diet, so on. So one of the questions that I was really interested in, coming back to this concept of language, um, Hong Kong being a multilingual territory, in terms of written official languages, English and um, written Chinese, both in traditional characters or simplified characters, are the official languages of Hong Kong. But of course, there's a diverse range of um, languages that are spoken and written and used in Hong Kong. But um, the big ones in terms of written reports are Chinese traditional characters normally and English. So I really wanted to kind of think about, well, what is the difference between news about Yeju and news about wild boar? Um, and I think it kind of links to this idea of how public, the public get information about wild boar. So what as well as the kind of what language such as English we're using but what kind of language we're using in these reports and how our forms kind of uh, uh, views are formed reformed developed change over time because obviously the media isn't just presenting incidents it's also potentially shaping um, agendas um, opinions presenting kind of editorial ideas and things as well and also who speaks who is quoted or referred to um, in these kinds of articles as well. So this is just one example. And this is work I've been doing with Yifu Wang. It's work in progress, um, but we're hoping to get to publish it soon. And this is just a little bit of like the geographical variation that we were looking at through Hong Kong. So this is English and this is Chinese. So like I said, traditional or simplified characters, they all came out. Um, and you do kind of see first off the lower numbers um, in English. Um, the, compared to Chinese sources. And also potentially that the English use might be concentrated in some specific areas. And this might reflect the kind of geographical location of where um, people who consume English language media might live. But it's also kind of interesting to us um, from a research perspective as well, 
um, that there's like more spread across the territory um, with the Rin Chinese. And then who speaks in these? Um, so if we like segregated the quotes into different groups, expert is normally an academic, residents, um, members of the government, NGOs would be people who are representing charities or specific concern groups or so on, who um, list that as their affiliation rather than an academic or government affiliation. So in terms of differences, there are more residents um, being quoted in the Chinese news and um, more um, NGOs in the English language news. So these are just some of the differences that we found. We also did other analyses um, on the language as well, if you wanna talk about that. But just to hop on from this, so I can show you a couple of more results. Um, we did look at attitudes towards wildlife and wild boars specifically and feeding behavior in the form of a survey. We had to do it online last year because of COVID, but with Melody Kong and the team, but we have done a second round of surveys just recently. And just a few highlights for you. Respondents who identified as men had a preference for reducing their encountering rate with boar as compared with those who identified as women. Respondents who believed that feeding would increase the risk of disease transmission wanted to reduce encountering rate and also oppose people feeding the boar. Very interestingly, people recruited from the group that own pets um, had the most support for feeding. It was quite cool because we were able to give different QR codes to different groups where we distributed it from so we could identify the ones associated with the pet owners. And then just to really briefly show you uh, work on boar diet and its impacts, um, Calvin Ma and the team have been doing stable isotope analysis that you can look at the um, diet of the boars over time and or how much of it is kind of human um, derived foods, processed foods that would show up differently to the natural diet. It doesn't allow us to distinguish between them foraging and rubbish or eating food that's like put out like this for the boars, but can give us some really information, uh, interesting information on how dependent the boars are on this. And just from our preliminary results, they're eating a really high proportion of these human derived foods um, from the ones that we've analyzed, but they are the ones being caught by the AFCD and translocated. So it's a specific sample. So essentially the goals of our project is to kind of consider a coexistent scenario for humans and wild boars, specifically for this Hong Kong um, context, to look into what is an acceptable evidence-based management strategy for interactions between humans and wild boar, acceptable to the people given their perceptions um, and other things that we're taking into account. And we want to possibly contribute to planning human behavior change strategies. But again, we really wanted to get this baseline and initial in information first and do these studies before we considered behavior change. And just to say that as well as boar, there's some other interesting large mammals in Hong Kong, including free ranging cattle and buffalo. So these are my colleagues, Alan and Kate at CTU, who we're gonna be collaborating more on that with as well. So look out for those studies. And with that, I just wanna thank BS for inviting me, all of my team, technicians, collaborators, everyone involved. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Hannah. Um, thank you for this really interesting talk. Um, I, I really didn't know about this issue at all. Uh, I'm sure many other people didn't as well. Um, uh, there's been a few questions. Um, uh, some have just come in, some uh, were answered earlier. Um, so taking the, uh, the first one here, um, is the first one is by Jackie Williams, and they ask, what are the implications of, for the behavioral ecology of the boar becoming synerbic? Yeah. We don't know, but of course there could be huge implications in terms of boldness, um, in terms of reproductive behavior. The, the bottom line is we haven't done a study of this in Hong Kong. The obvious kind of starting point for us was to look at the feeding behavior. And then there are opportunities to maybe track individuals and um, do some more um, test and analysis on them. But I would say based on other populations of wild boar and also other populations of animals that go into urban areas, the potential is huge <laughs> um, to affect every kind of kind of behavior. Um, so yes, it's very serious, but we're just at the start of this. So I can't give you any specifics. 
And I guess the, the follow on questions kind of related to this, this was by Christopher Williams, who asked in the forest of Dean, wild boar are quite shy. Why are they less shy in Hong Kong? We also see this, I live in Frankfurt in Germany and the, the boar here tend to hang out in the, the edge of the city in the forest, but I've never seen them enter it. So why in some cities are they um, entering uh, the human populated areas? Yeah, I think it might be a, a lot associated with the kind of experience that they have when they go into those areas. So if they have the experience of receiving a lot of food, um, including people actively putting out food for them, um, the, you know, that might be on kind of weigh, weighing up the risks worthwhile to go into that area. Also, the other thing that we don't know in Hong Kong is really just how big has our population become um, to the point that, you know, maybe some are being kind of pushed into these peri-urban and then increasingly urban areas as well. Um, so I think a lot of it is their kind of experience in the urban space. If they're managing or even thriving in that space, then it makes sense for them to occupy it, right? Thanks a lot, yeah. Um, so uh, a question which has a few upvotes here is by Sam Ross, who says, thanks for a great talk. Do you see any difference between Chinese and English reporting in the tone of the reports? Is either language generally more positive, negative? We're talking about these interactions. Yeah, that's a really good question. So we did do this analysis that is more on kind of the sentiments and the specific words that are used. And Yifu, who's my postdoc who did it, would probably be able to give you a thousand better answers than me. So apologies in advance to Yifu if I get this wrong. But my understanding was that we both got very negative and positive. We did get some kind of differences that, um, for example, whether it was kind of framed as a problem or not, more framed potentially as a problem, but also more focus on kind of um, local management strategies in the Chinese report. And then in the English report, we sometimes got more um, kind of explanations as the, of the boar behavior as them not intentionally um, being aggressive and this kind of being part of their natural behavior. But we got kind of a mix. Um, it's not like strictly divided by language. so. Hopefully we can give you more details of that in the paper. <laughs> okay, thank you. We've got time for one more question. There is other questions, um, but I think we only have time for one more. I'm gonna take this one from uh, Anne uh, Mopeli. Um, and she asks, are there other animals with whom they interact in the city? Maybe also some different interactions with day and night active animals. Yeah, that's a really good question actually as well. Something that I think about a lot, but I don't have any data on yet, so it's kind of speculative, is interactions with free-ranging dogs. Um, but then at night, we also have things like civets, porcupines, and so on. The boar are, interestingly here, quite active in the day, um, not just at the night, because I've lived in other cities like Berlin, where they're much more active at the night. Again, I think that links to the kind of risk profile that they're facing. Uh, different times of day and things like that. They're in Hong Kong, potentially they're feeling relatively safe um, in the day. So we don't have specific data for you on the interactions, but I think definitely the free ranging dogs of which there are more in Hong Kong than there might be say in, in England would be an interesting one to look at. Okay, thanks a lot. I think we have to um, finish there, but if you want, you can ask Anna, Hannah further questions by tweeting at her. Um, uh, her um, tweet handles just come out in the comments there um, with the hashtag Ecology Live. So um, I think we'll finish there. Thanks a lot, Hannah. This was really interesting. I have quite a few questions myself I'd like to ask, but unfortunately we don't have time. Um, and um, thanks a lot. I just want to say a little bit now about what's happening uh, next week. So next week, uh, we continue on at this earlier time of uh, 9 a.m., um, so those of you um, coming from other parts of the world that maybe haven't been able to watch um, Ecology Live before should be able to uh, now. Uh, next week, the speaker is Samrat Pawar from Imperial College London, who's going to be talking about thermal constraints on microbiome structure and functioning. Uh, so if you're watching this on YouTube, then do register for uh, uh, other um, so you can watch Ecology Live in the future. 
you can sign up uh, to be a BES member on the link there, which has just been sent out. So one last announcement is that um, the annual photography competition, uh, Capturing Ecology, the BES's ecology uh, photo competition has been uh, now launched. It's open to all members. There's six categories to choose from with uh, uh, very good prizes and the standards very high. Um, and often there's quite a bit of media coverage of these photos as well. Um, the, uh, it's going to be open until uh, July. Um, so, uh, and also you can sign up to membership with the link being sent out just now. So finally, I'll leave you with details from an offer of uh, today's sponsor, which is Oxford University Press. You can use the discount code on this slide to get a 30% discount from their Ecology Live reading list, which also includes the relevant book uh, to today's talk, Urban Evolutionary Biology. So with that, um, it's goodbye from me and goodbye from everyone at Ecology Live. Hope to see you next week uh, on next Thursday, again at 9am. Thank you a lot. 9am UK time, that is. Thank you. Goodbye.